Hi everyone and welcome to the Border Podcast. Today we have a very very special guest, Soumya Gupta from the Signal Impression and Core. Uh, Soumya writes for uh, the Signal Impression Core and she writes for uh, writes about media technology, consumers, creators, and everything in between. Um, and she started her weekly media primer exactly a year ago on the fourth of April. I remember. Uh, the news that are coming i remember forwarding to the people because i just met you before that and i was like i know this person and um i look forward to the wednesday newsletters of late her substack and if you didn't catch on yet i'm a massive fan and a follower welcome to the voiro podcast somya and congratulations on one year of the impression thank you so much navita and it's it means so much to me to know that folks like you are following it because uh you know that's the dream you write something from the outside or from the periphery and and you hope that people who make decisions who are running large or important businesses are, are able to see value in it and maybe some entertainment i mean that what's the fun of writing about media and entertainment if if you can't make some of it too absolutely absolutely i think uh, you know uh, what i like like about the way you write and what you write about is one of obviously the recency of information the simplicity of language and also the ease of reading right because you like thrown a gif here or there uh, you kind of like uh, simplified a little bit so it becomes super memorable so t- if i need to remember something even during the week or it has to strike me i kind of sometimes always remember it as you know the format in which your email comes in almost like you know how you study or study for exams you know exactly where it where it was so it's uh, it's super imprint- imprinted in my in my mind and i and i'm pretty sure that uh, you know people who read it um, you know have the similar uh, uh, feedback um if you don't read it obviously please subscribe to it um uh, you can uh, where where can you get a subscription from it as in is it on signal or core it's uh, so it's the impression dot this at the signal so that's its own substack you can subscribe to it through the substack app if you're a user you can uh, log in to the website or see any edition that maybe somebody sent you and there'll be a button where you can just put in your email id and subscribe and it's all free uh maybe we can send you a link uh or we yeah. can add it in the show notes we can uh, add we can we'll add it in the show notes so yeah. if you're not subscribed as yet please do subscribe you can uh, read it in substack or you can read it in your inbox whatever you prefer and if you follow me on twitter then you can always you'll always get the update uh nice yeah nice okay so since it's a year right i wanted to actually do a uh kind of a comparison in the entire year as to what you have seen change from your first uh, newsletter that you wrote which was about ott and bundling mx players at that time eminent acquisition uh, by uh, amazon and gen ai in content creation of course tiktok tiktok is is always part of our daily conversations as well although in india we don't have tiktok it's like always top of mind so what's changed in the last year in the media uh, industry that you've been covering that you see you know that is a difficult question to answer because uh, i think every week when i'm figuring out what we're writing next or when i'm reaching out to people for longer term stories you you realize that the more things are changing on a on a week to week level the more they remain the same so my first ever edition today last year was uh, on ott bundling and uh, why they're becoming increasingly important for distribution if you are in that business and i think today still that is uh, the overarching theme for everybody in the content industry if whether you're a whether you're a creative writer or producer or you own a platform we have even more platforms today than we did a year ago uh similarly i think some of my earlier uh, editions were on um, mna activity in the media business and by media that that's a very vast space we're talking about large conglomerates we're talking about smaller startups getting acquired that's still happening uh an overarching theme that we visited over and over again is uh the creation of home grown social media especially in short video uh when back when tiktok was first banned that was a uh, potentially seen as a short term thing that we're going to see a lot of home grown social media apps today we're still discussing this is it possible to build something in home grown social media is it not and that was an addition i just did a few weeks ago again so i think uh, we're now seeing depth develop in these in these some of these themes what was earlier seen as a as a, a short term thing or maybe a flash in the pan because one company got invested in uh, is now seen as an overarching business model that uh, that we'll see lots of offshoots of because capital is also flowing into companies that uh, can demonstrably show a profitable business model which in the media business i think is hardest compared to every other industry and i think the the other thing that we're often seeing now is um we're we're, we're seeing um more entrepreneurs talking about uh, 
not being a medium specific media business but but turning into essentially ip companies uh, regardless of where you're distributing in so audio companies talking about video video companies talking about audio so the way media companies will be seen in the future uh, is is we're at a turning point for that and i think in the coming year in the impression this is it's going to be a lot harder to write about it because we won't know how to value uh, media companies as the previous parameters may not work as well as they did so that probably is a big thing. yeah yeah so like you said uh, you know a lot of things that you know as things change they kind of remain the same and that's that's pretty much the case for anything in life as well like you, you always think that this is the this is the turning point and something is happening and then you realize that this happened maybe a year ago um you know especially when you think about uh, the decisions that were being made at the time uh, when you started the impression the same kind of issues continue over here the aspect of funding the availability of capital uh, content being very expensive to uh, create uh, the problems of discovery and also you know the whether whether the medium is dying or whether it is transforming or you know how do you value the medium in itself so uh, the recent um, uh, article that you wrote about uh, the radio star right uh, that was an eye opener to me because while i do listen to the radio maybe when i'm driving and say my bluetooth connection either is dead or my phone's dead or you know it's it's, it's usually because something has gone wrong with my phone or the connection uh it's still very entertaining and informative uh to to some level but i only listen to music uh, on the radio so you want to just talk about what this article covers and and why is radio suddenly making a resurgence and and where is it going from where it is today sure absolutely i think radio um, you know you don't see much reporting on it uh, when you talk about media reporting the majority of it tends to be on digital media and digital advertising Uh, but there was a time when radio was a, a really crucial part of a media planner's uh, time and and consideration and budgets obviously today of course it's seen as a relic it's not only law i mean tv is seen as a relic so radio of course is not going to get its place in the sun but what i saw uh, is that there are two major radio stocks listed um, in this country entertainment networks and uh, music broadcast which is mirchi and uh, radio city respectively Uh, these are very small stocks by valuation as well as revenue but they have outperformed not just the nifty media index which is the index of all media listed stocks in the country but also the nifty 50 which which is the largest 50 companies of this country by market cap now that's incredible that means there is some conviction among uh, participants in the market that these companies have long term uh, value and potential for growth now why that has happened is a uh, radio is a medium of serving content but that is not why we remember mirchi or radio city for i mean i grew up uh, knowing and remembering uh, by muscle memory almost uh, the jingles which were associated with every radio station i knew all their tuning frequencies by heart and and i knew what each of them stood for and that is actually what counts for something so what radio companies have realized whether they're listed or not is that there is uh, that they're not just holding on to a license to um, to broadcast on a frequency that's the initial asset that they may have spent money on but they're holding on to brand value they're holding on to brand recall and they're holding on to people who have become brands themselves you talked about radio jockeys um you know amin sayani recently passed away and that was really big news because he uh, he's a face of uh, for he's a face that is that represents memories for so many indians that's the kind of brand value that influencers today are trying to build in very increasingly fractured networks but back when mass media was only a few places uh, radio was a place where you you would go you become an rj and you become famous across the country or at least across those parts of the country in the language you speaking in so what radio companies have understood is they're holding on to um, essentially what today will be called influencers or creators they're holding on to brand recall they're holding on to channels that uh, have an audience so uh, music broadcast for example has talked about building um, uh, audience at scale on youtube and on uh, instagram which is exactly the kind of thing that uh, uh, you know a youtube mcn would be talking about in the 2010s they're talking about turning their radio jockeys into influencers for their tier 2 and tier 3 audience but that's because i still remember babbar share and i still remember uh, you know um, all the i mean i remember rj um, when nilesh mishra was an rj and he used to come to talk about yado ka idiot box of course he has his own company now but uh, these are these are the value creators that these companies are driving on of course with uh, with enel and uh, uh, mirchi 
they have the added advantage of having acquired Ghana.com, which was in a lot of trouble last year because it couldn't find a buyer. Uh, media reports suggested that they were trying to sell to Wink, owned by Airtel, and that deal fell through. So, uh, so they so they now have the opportunity to call themselves a digital streaming company. They do uh, frequency bro- bro- modulation broadcasting FM. They also have music streaming on digital, and that is where I think radio companies are going to go in the future. They become larger companies that own music as a as a value proposition delivered to you where you would like to hear it. And essentially, that's what I was talking about. All media companies are turning themselves into IP companies. And this is the radio's IP. And that was what the story was about in a, in a gist. Nice. So when you talk about IP, the first thing that hits me is that for any kind of IP, you need deep pockets, right? Because none of it is cheap. So uh, ultimately, who's going to survive at the end of the day is going to uh, going to be companies that actually can reach across and invest up front uh, in things that actually make sense in terms of content creation, whether it is actually keeping their content creators or investing in tooling as well as any kind of technology that's able to drive discovery. Uh, yeah. In that, have you seen a change uh, or have you been covering anything uh, from the AI space? Because, you know, I've been meeting a lot of our customers and uh, their CROs and CXOs, and there's a lot of noise around, um, uh, you know, Gen AI for content generation, right, mm-hmm. and creation. Um, and there's been a lot of investment and every CTO department has some kind of a budget or the other to experiment in this AI space. Um, there is one part of it, which is almost like a factory creation, right? Where you, you automate content creation. But what you touched upon a little bit, uh, you know, in, in your, in, in your description of this entire you know, rise of this radio star and the fact that you're creating uh, an influencer and the reference to the voice, right? In more ways than one, right? To creation of a voice in itself. Uh, that is, is is deep IP, right? And and I've seen online, uh, there are so many different AI tooling that you can use to say something in somebody else's voice, quote unquote, like in their actual intonation and their voice. I think Grimes has something online where you can have her say something that you are actually uh, talking about. But where do you think, uh, you know, in the next one year, uh, the focus of AI will be uh, in the media entertainment space, uh, you know, from your from your vantage point of how people are investing and how they're using it and, and so on and so forth. And I, I don't know whether you use any AI tooling uh, on uh, by yourself, but if you I do, you can also tell us. Any of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, AI is uh, very much the first thing that people talk about. I mean, regardless of what my interview agenda with somebody might be, there is, uh, as with any new technology that comes in, uh, there is a sense of maybe fear among uh, creators. Uh, while there is a sense of opportunity among people who own PLs and who are running businesses, for people who are actually in the, in the job of creating IP, it's they're seen it's seen as a competitor, and that's across all kinds of media. I'm talking about maybe the the junior writer who writes copy for an ad uh, agency, or someone like me who's been doing reporting, or maybe a, a filmmaker who's uh, hoping to cut their budgets for a short film. So. For them, there is a sense of fear. For people who own the PNL, there is, a, as we mentioned rightly, there's a sense of opportunity and maybe trying to find the right investment. What I, I have written a story actually on uh, early experimentation with AI in uh, newsrooms. So large uh, media conglomerates have been uh, using AI anchors to populate their segments in the downtimes, which is usually the afternoon. And India Today has been at the forefront of it. Uh, one of the radio channels also has an AI radio jockey. So these are early experiments to see whether you can um, at least fill in the gaps where you would earlier have hired a, a human being or human talent to uh, do essentially what is called uh, you know daily work. Uh, that's where the earliest use cases of AI are coming in. But I think for this year, the larger conversation may not be as much about the possibilities of AI as about the pushback for regulations on AI. So just today, I think the IT minister has talked about uh, formulating a law to protect publishers and creators in India. Uh, and, and I don't know what exactly those rules will take shape. I think they're still uh, being drafted. But that's exactly the same conversation we're seeing in the US. New York Times has sued OpenAI. Uh, I've written about uh, the Hollywood strikes, just giving readers in India perspective on what that would mean. And I know that among uh, Indian filmmakers, for example, the Screenwriters Association, these conversations have also come up informally about protecting yourself and your IP. But essentially, like you said, it all comes down to IP creation. Uh, 
we don't know yet if legally ip created on ai will be will be protected by law later or not and that i think will prevent people from making serious investments or a serious push to build businesses around generative ai at least not at scale because you need those frameworks or those guardrails in place before you can reasonably put in a lot of money so this may be the year of serious regulations and some way forward yeah i i i will tend to agree with you on that one because uh, you know everybody's kind of uh, while they are like i said mesmerized by the ai bubble uh, that is forming right now they they are also being very very cautious this morning i was reading the news uh, where the us congress has banned uh, their staff from using microsoft's copilot and this is within their outlook and uh, their their b2b software because ultimately they are saying that you know a lot of the stuff which is like technically of national security is being trained on uh, uh, you know uh, microsoft ai's copilot uh, ai tools which ultimately is being trained by open ai right because that's where the entire database actually goes in and gets trained and um, microsoft has committed to saying that um, that they will try and meet their security regulation so it's not surprising that everybody's kind of sitting up and saying hey okay are you training this but training it to do what right and to what yeah. game and when you speak about regulation right one of the things that i've always tried to figure is what is the punishment i mean you can have regulation at the end of the day but today i know if i don't pay my tax i'm going to get a massive uh, demand and a massive interest uh, there, there is a punishment for me right or i could i don't know if i do something wrong legally i could go to jail uh, yeah. but i haven't seen any kind of there's no there's nothing punitive in any of this like policy making in india at least around like uh, personal data protection or even ai it's just like guidelines soft guidelines around how you need to be careful about how you go to uh, um, uh, how how you train ai and then maybe there is some recourse that you can take legally saying that you're breaking the law and then you know you you're on your you're on your own but in the eu there is a there is actually a there is actually a uh, you know a, a definite amount of money you can i think you can be charged up, up, upwards of about 7% of your global revenues as a as total fine if you're if you're flouting uh, their ai uh, rules and, and things like that so there is there is the serious damage that you can cause uh, monetarily right uh, to an organization if they are actually flouting these ro- laws so i agree with you the, there is definitely going to be a lot of regulation and also uh, it kind of puts a dampener on experimentation because you want companies to start adopting the ai you're trying to develop and it's not cheap talent is not cheap either but everybody will be extra cautious because they don't want to be the people who uh, sort of open the door like a trojan horse right open the door to something that could probably go wrong in in the in the future i want to switch gears a little bit uh, you quoted and referenced a lot of uh, uh, you know referenced the ey um, uh, a uh, wrap up right on the report that they have uh, released very recently written by Ashish Virwani and uh, uh, you know the to support your radio uh, article and mm-hmm. uh, i did i just went uh, sector by sector to say did i did i in segmental performance i was like did i contribute to the demise or the growth of each of these sectors and i and i pretty much can sort of uh, stand behind all of these because it feels like we are participating heavily in in pushing up digital um, and also um also print uh, i don't know about you but i buy a newspaper at home only because i want to support my newspaper agent because i know he comes to my door every day and you know he say it's increased madam and so you know you have to pay him that's one example <laughs> yeah some 680 rupees a month and you're like forget it i'll just pay and earlier it used to be like you had to get up ca- cash together and now now he set himself up on upi and all of that and uh, i was talking to alina as well uh, you know but how i read the papers so i subscribe to uh, don't judge me but deccan herald and uh, the mint okay so okay. usually when you're trying to, uh, so it is you try to search for uh, an article um, and if it comes up on the mint and it says you know it's behind a subscription wall and subscribe i'll actually trudge back home and go through the newspaper pile to see which day it was because i paid for that article and like go read up that article and say okay okay now i know what's going on over here so print bucking the global trend right in india i feel it's a combination of many many things i learned a very interesting anecdote the other day i had gone to meet some of my customers in chennai and chennai pride of language for tamil is this un, like it's unmatchable it's and coming from a place like bangalore where i want to be proud of kannada but there is no pride of language over here and they're trying hard to make sure that it comes back right but in 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 chennai and in tamil nadu 
if you go anywhere uh, you they will never speak to you in english may they may know it but even in a business meeting if there are more than one person there's more than more than one person who can speak tamil they will they will lapse into tamil so much so that when i was uh, driving i was being driven to this office i asked this cab driver my tamil is rubbish okay i can understand but to speak is yeah. a bit bad so uh, and so i asked him hey do you know english i said do you english do you know english so he looks back at me looks back at me and says yes madam like ta i know english so <laughs> I mean, uh, you can say Hindi speakers do the same thing, and and worse, perhaps because uh, uh, we often assume that people in the room might might know Hindi, but mm-hmm. but there are business conversations you can only have reasonably in in your language, and and that's perhaps why you're seeing that bump up in uh, in regional language print because. Mm, there are some connections you you need your language in a uh, local reporting for instance uh you know like for for example recently i mean i'm i'm a journalist but the news that i have been following ardently for the last 3 months is when will gokhale bridge get built in andheri and <laughs> that's all i care about uh but that gives you the the uh, sense of how important civic reporting is and that has to be done in the language of the people who are more a local medium or cinema also a local medium you need uh, your advertisers want to target only those set of people and your audience also would like to know something that is in the microcosm of their lives and that microcosm doesn't go away just because you have the internet in fact it it reinforces it in many ways yeah so uh, in in chennai there is a new app that they have released uh, from the dinatanti group called min mini right mm-hmm. and they have citizen journalists they have uh, people who are reporting on stuff that's happening in and around their uh, uh, locality they have approved journalists as well and of course uh, you know as a newspaper you have so many different types of uh, journalists right some on roll some who are off roll who come in only for certain type of editorial etc so there is there is definitely a bump up and it is it's an interesting app the only thing is that as an outsider like when i download the app and i look at it uh, there is no place for me there right it is so it is so decidedly hyper local that it makes sense for only somebody who understands and appreciates and wants to be in the tamil community to be able to access it which is great because you know that is those are the hard choices that you need to make as a content creator uh, or as you know even while creating an ip it is mm-hmm. about one thing right it's not about 10000 things and then you then you know when you've like lost or won so um, you know from a from a segmental performance perspective did you how many movies did you watch last year you you know the 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 report says that there were over 1796 films that were released did how many did you watch i mean honestly uh, nobody watches the majority of films that are released in the country uh, creating a film and releasing it is, is is like a startup of its own right each time you go back you build the business you you get the financiers but uh, from what i understand the funnel uh, is is uh, narrowing even more so you're playing a game in the theaters of uh, you're playing a game of chance where the odds are very much stacked against you so if a film like say pathan or jailer does well it does outsize me well it makes all the money in the box office and that means everybody else gets squeezed out and uh, and that's why you know producers that i've spoken to or uh, people who have been in the business for years they often talk about how uh, uh, it's become perhaps unaffordable for a majority of people to release their films in theaters because you you just cannot win that game of chance and uh, then what you're winnowing out people who have the bigger budgets they're the only ones for whom it makes sense that has a downsize impact on everybody in the business an exhibitor the people who make money from those who go to the theaters so yeah to your question i think last year i may have watched 10 films and i tell people i i'm a i'm a film buff uh, <laughs> but in theaters in in theater. only, in, yeah, in, in yeah. theaters yeah so uh, you know you written this article about inox and pvr actually breaking the bank on their advertising revenues right from a cinema perspective uh, how do these guys stay uh, head above water if you know if they see their theaters going empty do they get a do they get a say in what films they actually pick up or is it something that they sign on with uh, a specific kind of distributor like how does that work like how do how how does the inox in a pvr actually decide who gets to show in their theaters and uh, what is in it for them that's a great question so actually the majority of the exhibitor industry is in inox and pvr but they have an outsized influence because the rest is a 
very largely fragmented long tail business of single screen owners and regional chain owners all of whom have personal relationships so for instance in the southern states a lot of exhibitor chains maybe four or five screens each are uh, owned directly or indirectly by a film star so that brings them bargaining power uh, when they're dealing with a distributor or a filmmaker on on what title they'd like to show and what sort of revenue share they'd like to have uh, pvr inox has the advantage of being the largest national chain they also have the advantage of being a uh, representative of the most premium customer their, their ticket prices are the highest uh, they make a lot more money uh, as a share of overall national box office from english films and on from large uh, large scale hindi films but for instance when it's uh, when it's say like a gadar to last year or uh, again i'll go back to jailer i'll go back to kannada films that are doing so much better as a multiple of the investment that they've put in uh, pv inox share starts to fall a little bit because that's where the single screen crowd comes in so your bargaining power depends on uh, what audience you can drive to the distributor of the film uh, for an english film uh, the the bargaining power will be a lot more with uh, pvr inox because that's where the audience resides but i'm sure that for the next rajini film um, you know that's never going to be the case they will all he, he drives the audience the pvr right. he doesn't need pvr pvr needs him and in fact one of their focus has been uh, in the last year to increase the penetration in southern markets uh, another great example and this is a story that i i hope i can do one day is you know the actor ajay devgan has invested in a chain of uh, multiplexes largely oh. in, in in gujarat yeah and in tier two towns and his value proposition is really great which is uh, you know audiences don't uh, cannot afford uh, the typical multiplex experience in tier two towns which is very expensive but they do they would like to upgrade from a single screen theater so there is a very big white space there and uh, of course he's an actor he's a producer he distributes his own films as well and now he gets to be an exhibitor in these chains so you get every part of the value chain so i think later on we'll see uh, in the next few years we'll see a lot more such innovative models from people within the industry who who have that star power and consequently they also have that money and the sense of business so it is a question yes pvr inox uh, can bargain but a lot of this bargaining is on personal relationships and pull yeah understood all right so upcoming for the next year what do we expect from uh, the impression i know you already hinted saying that man this is becoming one big chakra view of things <laughs> right where everybody is trying to do uh, everything at the same time all at once but uh, like what do you feel you're going to continue doing what do you think that's going to happen new that we can look forward to at the impression um, and you know what's happening for 2024 25 you know, great questions actually i'm uh, in the process of, of getting reader feedback as well on this on what they'd like to see uh you know one big thing that i think will be an overarching theme is regulation this year so uh, my background isn't in tech policy but i'm hoping to bring more perspectives uh from the outside on where policy will take us in in advertising in particularly ad fraud which is talked about very little in india but it's obviously a big problem here as it is anywhere in the world uh and on ai generative ai uh you know other forms of ai usage across media and entertainment so we'll see more such conflicts i'm sure and and more regulation attempts so there will be discussions there i think the other thing to talk about would be the aftermath of these massive mergers and acquisitions that have happened in media i mean i think right now the pressure is on for anybody covering the space to understand what will be the impact of the of the disney and reliance merger for instance or what happens to z and sony because of their loss of merger uh what happens to smaller companies that have perhaps run out of time to to grow beyond the scale that they're at and they need to look for a buyer this is also something that's playing out in the states uh so that will be the other thing i think uh what has been uh missing in media coverage is the understanding that media everything has become a media business so you know a retail reporter writing on amazon or quick commerce they understand now that a majority of these companies bottom lines in the future is going to come from advertising and they're eating into existing ad revenues so if you are covering ads and if you're covering marketing uh, unfortunately you need to now start understanding lots of various kinds of business models uh, i don't know about you kavita but i'm being hit by ads on uber every time i order uh, okay yeah. yeah. and uh, and i'm like, like when you are when you are trying to order something there's something else kind of blocking your uh, experience right saying that yeah. or uh, deliver something or buy something else and you're like can i get to what i came to this app for to begin with 
exactly and you you see ads in places you you never expect you see ads uh innovations in advertising in places which you had written off like billboards for example uh they're considered uh, boring but they're the they're the they're the ones that are carrying the industry on its back and they're the ones making money so uh so yes i'm hoping to give everybody a sense of more places where things might transform and more interlinkages between uh parts of the media we consider a relic and parts of the media that uh, we consider you know sexy quote quote and quote yeah. Uh, because it's all one and the same at this point. Yeah. You know, to your point on Uber, I was just looking it up. Uh, you know, I remember trying to follow how much they were doing, but they're looking like they're going to track to a billion dollars very, very soon. And they started oh. off with 150 or so million dollars in 2021. And they are firmly in what in what we are all classifying them as a retail media space because, you know, they are mm-hmm. trying to get people who have credit cards on their platform, ability to purchase. And, you know, that's how they get those audiences to actually transact and convert. Um, closer to home, we are seeing Mintra, Flipkart, and all of these guys also do a whole bunch in trying to figure out their own retail media strategy. We have like, uh, I think you cover Good Glam as well, right? At the Signal, um, yeah. I think the yeah. they are also trying to do a whole bunch. There's Purple and Nike who's trying to do everything, or they can to sort of mop up this market share and also drive transactions. Uh, mm-hmm. So there is a there is a clear divide in the market where there is. There is performance advertising, and then you know driving transactions and uh, making sure that you are able to uh, top and tail your uh, uh, revenue, right? So the top line is then when you skim off the top of making sure that every single uh, ad that passes through your platform or your network, you get a share of that CPM or whatever ROI you're delivering or CPC or uh, uh, VTR or whatever. And then there is the bottom part, which is where once a transaction is driven, you actually take a transaction cost as well. Right. Mm-hmm. So earlier on, what people would do um, inside marketplaces was that, given a projected transaction cost, a uh, transaction, and the 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 percentage of the share of that transaction that uh, the marketplace would get, they would use that budget to start driving marketing for that particular seller on the platform, and literally kind of like rinse and repeat that. But now they have an additional line that's coming in, which is just pure profit, right? Which is advertising. And then on top of advertising, they're also paying them for the transactions that they are driving on that particular platform. So there's going to be a lot of, it's going to be a lot of focus on, like you said, ad fraud to be able to figure out attribution, who drove that transaction, who should I pay, like which part of the value chain should I pay, consolidation in the value chain as well. Uh, so there's lots to look forward to in, you know, and uh, in what you're going to be writing about. And I'm very interested in the tech policy part of it because I want to know who is going to jail us at the end of this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just need to know who's going to go to jail. That's been my, my serious preoccupation over any of this privacy stuff because otherwise it just sounds very moralistic and fluffy, right? About what you should be doing and how you could do it and so on and so forth. But there's nothing, there's no, there's no punishment behind it. So like, how are you going to get people to toe the line? But anyway, yeah. so... So you want to tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, I know the beginning of the show you 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 spoke about how we can get in touch with you, but uh, uh, is there uh, anything else that you're going to be coming out with? Are you going to be com- Are you on a podcast along with Signal? Do you do you? Uh... Yeah. So the impression is part of a family of products. Uh, if you've come for media coverage, but you want to understand more about um, technology, about business, and about geopolitics, which has an outsized impact today on on the way we do business, then you should definitely subscribe to The Signal, which is also free. It's daily. It's our newsletter that gives you a sense of markets and all of these themes that I talked about every morning at 8 a.m. A great little primer to get you started for the day. You don't have to trudge through your social media feeds and all those ads we just talked about. You can can get it directly from us. We also have a morning podcast called The Signal Daily. Uh, That also dives a little bit deeper into two major stories of the day. We often have guests, so you can hear from people outside of just us and our voices. (laughs) But uh, that is available on anywhere where you get your podcasts. And of course, we're in the process. We've merged with a, a, a company called The Core, that is more focused on um, core industry reporting. So if you are somebody who understands or would like to understand uh, hard industries like manufacturing, uh, renewable energy, uh, you know, that sort of stuff where serious money is getting made, then that's the place for you. Uh, that also comes with its own, the core podcast, which is him by the founder of Govind Raj Ethiraj. So in all, uh, it's a lot of offerings, but come to us and you will get a complete sense of, uh, whatever you are trying to understand about the way Indian economy is shaping. 
fantastic more power to you somia and to the entire team at core signal impression and we are looking forward to hearing more from you all reading more about you all also paying for your subscriptions because i know that it's that's very gentle gentle suggestion at the end of your uh uh Uh, email as I said, you can subscribe right now. Maybe we'll charge you in the future. I said, just go rip the bandaid and make people pay for it. I'm pretty sure that uh, nobody will uh, grudge you that. Uh, everybody is paying for stuff. Clearly, according to the EY report, there has been definitely an increase in subscriptions, and people are comfortable and they know why they are paying for what they are paying for. Right. On that note, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Lena. Thank you, Santosh. Gautam, who's not here, but who'll edit this in the future, and thank you everybody for listening. Mm-hmm.